this evening's uh, talk is, as the first slide indicates, uh, Glenn Lee. Is she a lucky ship? Has to be. She survived 125 years and all of her sisters by almost 100 years. So if I can roll on with the talk. I intend to talk about the design, the technology environment of the 19th century Clyde shipbuilding business, first of all. The working history of Glen Lee, her decline and rescue, her eventual return to the Clyde and restoration. A background note, from the 1800s, Clyde had become the premier white hot marine technology design and manufacturing center of excellence. It was the leading shipbuilding river worldwide. Britain at that time produced 82% of the world's ships. The majority of these were built on the Clyde. Between 1882 and 1892 were the peak building years for large square rig sailing ships on the Clyde, with 271 launched in this period. Russell and Company were the world leader in annual launched tonnage. Yards were all privately owned with close owner control and ships were designed by the chief draftsman. Naval architecture hadn't really got onto the map at that point. Small management teams and most ships were built in a piecework system. Good wages for the men in boom times, but living conditions were, to put it mildly, appalling by today's standards, and the bread line was really that in downturns. Changing technology, materials and propulsion principally. In 1812, almost all ships were of wooden construction leaked, rotted, were very expensive to operate and suffered high losses. That year, the first seagoing passenger steamship in the world ventured afloat here on the Clyde. The replica is at Port Glasgow. The development of steam propulsion proceeded. In parallel, was a large ocean-going sailing ship for almost a hundred years. Clyde side's Clyde-built reputation was from sailing ships as much as in the better-known steamship. By 1850, the frame of most ships was of iron, which was increasingly available from the local industrial revolution and provided more durable but still wooden planked hulls. The tea clip of Cutty Sark of 1869 is a late example of a composite hull of this sort and can be visited at Greenwich. By 1870, riveted iron hulls with iron masts and spars were prevalent in Clyde Yards. These were more expensive to build, but much more durable, less leaky and less expensive to operate. The beginning of mass production and standardized hull design was with William Todd Lisco's Falls of Clyde design, built by Russell and Company, where he was chief draftsman and a partner. Iron, then steel introduction fostered rapid developments in sail and steam powered ships in parallel. The transition from deep water sailing ships to steam took almost a century, and by 1890, square rigged ocean carriers were at the final peak of design. This was a most significant development. Most yards, as I said, used an iron framing design in hulls, much as they had built in wood, but with little continuity of design. Such practices were extremely wasteful of resources and each new ship was a learning game for all engaged in the build process. The standardized hull structure developed by William Todd Lisco of Russell and Company in 1874 was widely copied in Britain and used by Russell, Anderson, Roger and Lisco in all their sailing ships. The center section of this, which is in fact the center section of Falls of Clyde, is almost identical to that of uh, Glen Lee. Glen Lee was launched, according to the Greenock Telegraph, at 10 o'clock in the morning of December 1896, just over 125 years ago. The year she was launched, the development of the steamship had produced Clyde Shipping Company's Gar Moyle, the epitome of high efficiency modern steamships of a similar size to Glen Lee. She could run to a schedule, used 20% of the coal of earlier simple engines, and could challenge the big sailors on ocean routes. She used an ounce of coal per tonne mile of voyage. By 1900, the big deep water sailing carriers suffered further setbacks with the opening of the Suez Canal and a big rise in the insurance rates for sailing ships at Lloyd's. The opening of the Panama Canal in 1914 was the last straw. Turning to the builders. <clears throat> in 1874, the Russell Company was formed 
And um, this continued and became probably the best in Europe, certainly in UK, partnership for shipbuilding. And Joseph Russell retired in 1891, bringing the partnership to a close. Anderson Roger took the Bay Yard and William Lithgow took the other yards in Port Glasgow and Greenock. Uh, this shows Port Glasgow overlaid with the motorway in blue arriving in Port Glasgow outside Ferguson Yard shown in as a red square. And the blue outline is that of Anderson Rogers Yard, the dry dock being on the left hand bottom corner, uh, right next to the town hall buildings, which are still there. Um, an interesting aside, the dry dock uh, is very close to the main road of the day. And uh, one of my elderly friends said that uh, in 1926, a schooner was in the dry dock, placed well forward, and the bowsprit was under the tram wires with obvious consequences for a fortnight. Interesting times. Glenley was built in this yard with the bow facing east, and when she was fully rigged ready for launch, the bowsprit was about where the fire station is today, just short of the roundabout. The yard was very restricted in size of ships it could launch, and when the company failed in 1914, it closed for good. The Red Square is the approximate location of Ferguson's today, and all these harbours have now been infilled. Both Anderson Roger and William Lithgow made vast fortunes from their businesses and proved very benevolent donors to the local community. In 1891, the town had virtually no amenities and the housing and living conditions were horrible, with no clean water, no sewerage and extreme slum conditions throughout the Bay Area. They built a vast number of new homes for their workers' families, funded waterworks, developments, sewerage and, for example, Anderson Roger gifted the Greenock High Infirmary to the population. Today it's the Argowan Hospice and the commemoration window shown on the right is still there. The fleet of speculatively built sailing ships. Anderson Roger created these ships while building far more ships for contracted customers, around 110 other ships during his building period. To provide a steady workload for business, giving huge efficiency gains and cost reductions, keeping his workforce together and nourished, these speculative builds were traded until sold. Of the 10 speculative built ships, only three survived until 1925. Two were World War I losses to U-boats, two foundered, three were wrecked, and one was burnt to a hulk on the Falklands Island when a coal cargo self-ignited. Only one of them made it to the breakers at Sunderland. After 1926, Glen Lee was alone, but in a completely different trade operating as a naval training ship. Turning to the um, British owners, in 1896, Sterling Ship Management was a company managed by Anderson Rogers' brother-in-law, and uh, he operated the various spec-built ships on voyages until they were sold, most after one voyage, one during its first voyage. When she arrived back in London from her first voyage to the west coast of America and her first grounding, on the west coast of America. Um, she was sold to Robert Ferguson of Dundee, who operated a number of sailing ships called the Mount Line. All the ships had uh, names ending in Mount. Uh, Glen Lee ran one voyage and uh, was then renamed Isla Mount. He ran into trouble in 1905 and uh, she was sold along with several other ships, in this case to Robert Thomas, the Cardiff Castle Line registered in Liverpool. And as Isla Mount, she continued to operate until 1918, when he too ran into a bad patch with a number of losses and uh, the company failed. In 1918, with the company failure, the ship passed to the government ownership and was allocated to John Stewart and Company, the shipping controller. And he continued to operate her as Isla Mount until sold to Italy. Glenlee is Isla Mount. This photograph was taken uh, in Melbourne. And if you look very carefully at the foremast on the Tugallan Yard, that's the upper set of yards, there's a man working on the extremity of the Tugallan starboard side. Below him on the top mast, the, the topsail yards, there's a man on the starboard side and two on the port side. So yes, even in port, they work pretty hard to maintain these ships. 
She had a crew of around 25 usually, but it varied considerably down to about 13 on one occasion. In 1910, she grounded on the Truebridge Shoal off Adelaide and then sailed to Melbourne for dry docking and repairs. You'll notice there are no dockside cranes and the ship's main yard and the spar on the mizzen were rigged for cargo working, which made it a very slow business indeed. Glen Lee's foreign owners from 1919 onwards. Stewart and Company sold her for £13 a tonne, just over £19,000 to an Italian three-ship company who quite surprisingly fitted this elderly ship and the other two British-built square riggers they cheaply acquired with twin oil engines, a boiler, and a twin deck plus electric lighting. Glen Lee, then Isle Mount, was renamed Clara Stella of Genoa and did one voyage to Tunis before the owners folded in 1921 in a major recession and the last great pandemic. She was auctioned on the orders of the creditors in Trieste in 1921 and the Royal Spanish Navy bought both Clara Stella and Augustella for 38,000 a pair. Clara Stella was now renamed Galatea. Augustella became Minerva. Galatea was the officer training ship and had some 38,672 pounds spent converting her and entered service in 1922 with 12 officers, 30 petty officers and over 200 cadets. It was quite an extensive um, conversion. Until this point, the cargo hold would be in a vast empty space below the deck and all accommodation was on deck. The officer accommodation was aft above the machinery, ratings, cadet accommodation and marines and so forth. There was a magazine, wine tanks and a huge number of water tanks to service this 10 times increase in the number of people aboard. Some 4,000 officers and crew had sailed with her in her 37 years at sea. And the photo was taken from the gig as the falls can be seen at the stern trailing in the water. On the 1st January 1954 in a hurricane in the North Atlantic, 20 cadets had broken limbs, seven sails were lost, major hull damage was suffered and this was repaired in New York. After her last voyage in 1959, she was decommissioned in 1962 to harbour training and was located at the La Carana base in Ferrol, northwest Spain, until 1972 on this duty. Thereafter, she languished for a period and a scheme to replate her corroded lower hull was carried out and she was towed to Seville without her rig in 1985. The butchered rig travelled separately in landing craft, parts being left at docks in Cadiz and Seville at 40 miles up the Guadalquivir River. Plans to refit her to a museum ship at Seville Expo 92 were beyond available cash and were abandoned. And she lay derelict at Seville from 1985 to 1992. There she was um, <clears throat> vandalised, all the brass and bronzes were stolen, she was sunk, she was set on fire, the fire damage can be seen towards the stern. And she eventually became an embarrassment to the Spanish Navy who still owned her, and she was put up for auction. The Clyde Ship Trust had tried to save the Carrick, city of Adelaide, and had failed. Greenock Waterfront had been interested in Galatea briefly in 1989, but didn't proceed. Fred Walker, naval architect, advisor to the National Maritime Museum, had inspected her in 1992 and declared her savable, albeit at considerable cost. Clyde Maritime Trust found out some eight days before her auction for scrap in 1992 from our naval attaché in Madrid. Hamish Hardy was dispatched to Madrid clutching a briefcase filled with sterling. After some quite tricky negotiations, she was theirs for 8 million pesetas, or about £40,000 in money of the day. This is a really big preparation job, removing flying bridge and all sorts of other structures and making her seaworthy for the voyage home. And this was undertaken by local contractors, directed by Murray Scrimmager. And she had to be acceptable to the Spanish authorities for the Down River tow to the Gulf of Cadiz and uh, the London Salvage Association for a voyage towing certificate home. 
the tug Wallasey of United Towing, 420 tons and 2,600 horsepower, captained by Clifford Wilshire, um, took her in tow, and the riding crew comprised of Captain Alistair Miller, a uh, senior Clyde pilot, Murray Scrimmager, who was an ex Royal Navy engineer commander, and also a merchant Navy chief engineer, and Charlie McIntyre, former chief rigger John Brown and Company, formed the crew. They were not lacking in experience or guts. They loaded a generator, portable pumps, barrels of drinking water, a camping stove, and settled down in the ruined deck house on a three shift watch for an eventful nine day voyage. At 0800 on the 1st of June 93, they left Seville for the 40 mile tour down Guanajuato River to the sea. At 1640, Spanish River pilot disembarked and the 1380 mile tour to began. The LSA certificate said that they were only permitted to tow in winds of force five or less, and that no less than five, six knots, or no more than six knots, and they did not plan on running for shelter. They dealt with some big issues on a pitching, wildly rolling halt and poor weather and winds well above four or five. However, they arrived in Greenock after a nine-day, 1380 mile tow on the early afternoon of the 9th of June and past the Cloth Lighthouse and on into the James Watt Dock. That meant they had uh, travelled from the mouth of Guanajuato River to the Cloth in 188 hours at an average of 7.3 knots, so much for the speed limit. Captain Ignacio Martel, who had been the master of the tour from Ferrol down to Seville, commented, and I who thought I had undertaken a feat in bringing her the 400 miles from Ferrol to Seville, because it was complicated to move her without sinking her. Somehow the Scots took her in a moment from the city, without any difficulty at all, and as far as Glasgow no less. I saw the difference between a maritime country and one that does not, even though they both have a sea. The arrival in Greenock, the um, ship was burst under the large hammerhead crane, which is still there, but it was still in commission at that point. And two spars had been carried on the weakened deck, one of them the bowsprit. And this was probably the first step in the reconstruction of the ship. Quite a difficult job because the chap driving the crane could not see what he was doing with the heel end of the bowsprit, which is under the foredeck and was finally fitted. The fire damaged hull was taken into Garville Dry Dock once she had managed to be trimmed out level, and the propellers and shafts were removed fairly quickly. You can see the damage to the after part of the ship here. Once she was dry docked, a number of the volunteers and members of the trust went to see the hull. It was a sobering moment for all. Some wag actually asked, should we not have gone the extra mile to Smith and Houston support Glasgow Shipbreakers? He had a point. There was a huge amount of uh, redundant and damaged Spanish equipment in the hull, and this is the water tanks after they started burning these up. The Spanish, to trim her down to act as a training ship, had uh, filled the bottom of the ship with scrap, cemented in place with concrete, and this all had to be dug out with a jackhammer, carefully, because she was afloat, and uh, one or two holes were created by jackhammers going through the bottom of the ship. So, not a, an easy task. The <clears throat> equipment on the ship comprised two generators and two main engines. The two main engines were left in place, but one of the generators had to be removed and this is the five-ton flywheel being lifted out of the ship from the central generator. The reconstruction, once all the cement was out of the ship, the bottom of the ship was largely recoated with um, an epoxy after the um, hull had been cleaned up to standard A2 with blasting. Some of it wasn't accessible and that still has to be attended to. The damaged poop was um, unfortunately uh, severely buckled by the fire in terms of the top beams and the lower beams, and these were all replaced with steel, as were the edging or uh, stringer plates. The steel was provided by British Steel free of charge. 
Riveters had come out of retirement to Garville Clyde, and these were employed on making new size, new original size deck houses, correct hatch combings, and much else to replace the modifications the Spanish had put in place. Once the Spanish realized that um, Clyde Maritime Trust were actually working hard to rebuild it, they helped find the cut up masts and yards where they had been dumped in Seville, Greece. Henry Abram arranged for the P&O organization to bring them back to Glasgow. And uh, the rig down had certainly been an oxyacetylene slash and burn job. The rigging here is just a tangled mess, but it was required to be able to visualize and redesign the rig. Many items are missing, and some of the major items like this, uh, which is well over a one and a half meters or 48 inches across crane swivel, which supports the yards and allows it to move laterally and tilt. The mass sections as they, rear, as they arrived from Spain had been quite badly chewed up by simply using burning gear to bring the mass down and then chop them into portable lengths. These were refabricated uh, under an inspection, which was equivalent to Lloyd's Register of the day, and uh, all the parts were proof tested and ultrasonically inspected. An example of the slash and burn technique, this was the, the forged spectacle plate, which would connect a lower mast to a top mast or a top mast to to gallant mast. And it's simply been burnt through. Not something you would do if you intended to re-rig the ship, but uh, maybe the chaps at uh, Fennel didn't want people down in the south of Spain to be able to do it too easily. It was a good idea to check that these all fitted before working 150 feet aloft. As the re-rigging progressed, uh, this is a good example of how ships are actually rigged without using cranes in terms of the mizzen mast. The top mast was placed within the spectacle plate top and at the spreaders, and then a tackle rigged down from the top of the top of the main mast or the lower mast to the heel of the top mast and it was pulled up into position and a thid or pin pushed through the heel so that it couldn't descend. The decks were relayed throughout the ship in Opepe, which is a West African hardwood, a third of the price of teak and environmentally sustainable. Quite an exercise. Cocking the 86 square meters of Opepe decking was also quite an exercise, hard on the knees and shoulders. Um, the caulking was initially with caulk, cotton in the bottom of the groove, then hemp, rolled hemp, and then as can be seen on the left, it was paid with uh, a tarry material, which is called Jeffrey's Number no. 2 Marine Glue, a traditional caulking compound. A replacement chart room, skylights, and a steering box, and a number of other items were made by Scott Rouser of Leith. And uh, these were magnificent works, they still are. The figurehead had been lost when she went into Italian ownership and converted to Galatea, the training ship. So they had kept that uh, figurehead and many other things. So a new figurehead had to be made to patterns which were available as the original. The windlass on arrival was in an appalling condition as with nearly all the other equipment on the ship, rusted solid and uh, really not looking at all pretty. However, Weir Group turned two and Weir Pumps reconditioned the windlass as a project and it is now completely functional. Many items had to be cast to the original design as the Spaniards had either damaged them or replaced them with other things. These are basically the bullets for the poor peak and uh, focal head and the um, fair leads. Passing up river after the 1999 presentation of the ship for the first time at the National Exhibition on the Clyde of the Tall Ships. And she's passing the arrows here. As you can see, the decks are pretty bare. There are no davits uh, and many other items are still to be added. However, she did open to the general public as uh, a museum ship in 2000. 
and what continued. The main engines were cleaned up and uh, viewing galleries installed and uh, made presentable. One of the things we had to do was make a new cast steel mooring port because one of these is badly fractured and there's a danger that it could pull out and uh, cause considerable damage in storms. Our um, volunteers and crew have manufactured two lifeboats, the captain's gig, a pinnace, and uh, we have since then managed to manufacture the Davids, uh, lighthouses, ventilators, and many other items. The key items in the Spanish Navy Museum are all of the anchors. We've got two smaller ones now, but uh, the three big power anchors of 33 hundreds are not available to us. The figurehead, as I said, was replaced. The freshwater pump is missing, it's in the museum. And all the rigging and blocks that they took off the ship are uh, replaced in any case with new ones. The steering wheel had to be replaced with that too is in the museum. And the main manual bilge pump, which is a large item and a significantly missing item, is in the Ferrol Museum and has not been released to us. However, there is a similar pump, slightly larger, on Balclusa, a Clyde built ship currently resident in San Francisco and where I have a number of friends over the last 20, 25 years. We've given them quite a bit of technical help. And they in turn sent us these photographs, a complete set of measurements. And as they were scanning the ship, they kindly also gave us a 3D scan of their pump, which is completely dimensioned. And uh, friends out in Spain who look after the museum there have also provided measurements of Galatea's original pump or Glen Lee's original pump. Uh, this was modified by a box structure in the centre instead of an A-frame. And uh, we are building a replica, a working replica, uh, to the original design. We've managed to cast the two flywheels for that with George Taylor of Hamilton doing the work for us. Uh, we've also managed to get the crankshaft and various other items forged by a Rotherham forge at cost. It's been quite surprising. The whole ship has depended heavily on all sorts of assistance, both financial and in kind, to get to the position she's in today, from basically a virtual wreck. The cream and the custom, I suppose, was the National Historic Ships Organization declared her static flagship in 2021. And yes, that was much appreciated. And today she resides alongside the museum, dreaming here in the dawn on the Clyde.